everyone, and welcome. This is John Lynn, founder and chief editor at Healthcare IT Today. We're excited to have another in our series of health IT interviews. And today, our special guest is Shelby Senderford. She's founder and CEO of DocPace. Welcome, Shelby. Thank you, John. I am so excited to be here today with you. Yeah, I wish I was in New Orleans with you, but anyway, that's a different story for another day. But yeah, for those that are, uh, don't know about you and DocPace, tell us a little bit about yourself and your company. I would love to do that. So as you've just shed some light on, I am in New Orleans, Louisiana, born and raised here. Um, and I am the founder and CEO of DocPace, which I started now almost seven years ago wow. um, after finishing undergrad at Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas. Uh, during my undergrad, I was actually working in hospital administration as an intern and um, you know, spent semester attending meetings and really just learning as much as I possibly could about um, healthcare. And going into it, at first I thought I was on the path to being a PA. And um, actually during my time there is when I um, changed paths and was ultimately observing all of the, the challenges and obstacles and realizing where um, some of the problems uh, lie and you know realizing where some of the solutions could be implemented and that's how the idea for DocPace was born. So what we're doing at DocPace is solving all of the challenges that come along with scheduling patients for uh, doctor's appointments. And we're doing this with advanced statistics and AI. But before I get too technical on you there, um, if you're a patient, I'm sure at some point you've waited in a waiting room and you're familiar with that experience. Unfortunately. If you're <laughs> I think we and all if have you're that. well, we'll dive a little bit more into into that. Um, but if you're, you know, practice staff member, then you've probably dealt with challenges of coordinating care for your patients, whether that's, you know, making sure they show up on time or um, making sure they have the right appointment set, um, or if you're a provider you're just trying to schedule your day so that you can help serve as many patients as possible. However, it turns out that it's very challenging to coordinate all of these moving parts um, manually. And so that's what our AI system is helping do. And it's done with a combination of an automated AI assistant and a virtual waiting room. Um, and that's to help make this whole process easier for the patients, the staff, the providers, pretty much everyone involved. Um, and just to dive a little bit deeper into DocPace itself, it's the automated AI assistant is actually using historical appointment data to better understand what's going to happen today okay. and further provide the practice with insights so that they can keep the day running smoothly and efficiently. And on the flip side of that, the virtual waiting room, which is um, the feature that is shared with patients, um, is used to stay in communication with those patients with any changes that might happen and give them a suggested arrival time so that they can show up in the time that helps them be seen as quickly as possible. And so at the end of the day, with all of this implemented, a practice is able to um, increase their, you know, serve more patients, but also minimize the amount of time that patients have to wait. So it ends up being quite a win-win solution for everyone. Yeah, I love your story of wanting to be a PA and kind of seeing other opportunities. I, I actually just met a lady this weekend uh, in Nashville, and she had kind of a similar story. She wanted to be in healthcare, but she, she said, I don't like needles, right? <laughs> and so she's like, I didn't know that, you know, what options I had. So it's interesting to hear that story. And I think it's even more interesting that you've been working on this for seven years, because mm -hmm. the solution is so apt during COVID, right? I mean, so many people for, were looking for that. And I think it's, it's, it's interesting, your virtual waiting room solution. And I guess I would ask, you know, this question and, you know, maybe it's 
did COVID-19 kill the waiting room or is the waiting room in healthcare dead? What do you think about that? <laughs> well, you know, that is a great question. Um, and I don't know if I would quite use the term dead at this point in time, but I do believe that there has been a massive shift over the past, let's say 15 months or so around waiting rooms. Um, and here's kind of my, my thought process behind it and what I, what I believe has happened. Um, but, you know, traditionally we base our beliefs off of our experiences and historically we've known no different than to wait in a waiting room when you're going to see your healthcare provider. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And as soon as we had to do things differently during COVID um, patients experienced healthcare in a new way. And so now the belief is there that the experience can be different. Um, and in parallel to that, the same thing has happened on the, the office staff side as well. And they've experienced a similar shift because they had to put new processes and procedures in place to be able to you know, do the check-ins and the screeners and the paperwork. And upon implementing all those changes, they've found that this other way can work as well. And so, um, you know, if you look at it, kind of big picture behavioral change is very tricky, but when you had this kind of external factor come in and force change upon everyone, let's say, um, it ultimately ended up helping shift perspectives. Yeah. And I believe that's what we've seen happen in the waiting room. Yeah. And I mean, it's interesting to think about the history of the waiting room, right? Like, why did we even have them in the first place? I mean, it's kind of nice from a logistical perspective, you have somewhere to wait, but it also feels like we've abused it, right? Like, to, you know, and I'd love to hear any of your thoughts since you've dove into this, right? Like, why did we even have them? And, you know, how are they being used? I mean, I think it seems like, you know, when I go into the waiting room, they're using it for a logistical purpose, which is the doctor's behind. And this is, a, mm -hmm. hey, oh, and here's a place to wait and an excuse for them to, <laughs> that it's okay to be behind. But, you know, anyway, I mean, how do you see the, the, what the, the purpose the waiting room served and what can be done so we don't need them going forward? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's a very fair and, and valid question to, um, to ask. And, you know, really when you boiled down to it, it's because it's, it's near impossible for a human to manually fill and organize a sc schedule in such a way that there's never any gaps or bottlenecks that happen throughout the day. Mm -hmm. um, there are just, there's too many moving parts. There's too many variables at play and uh, it's impossible for the human brain to really run enough calculations in an instant to get it right. Um, and so what we've done is the second best option and that's to create a buffer for when the errors do happen. And that buffer is called a waiting room, just mm -hmm. as you've alluded to. Um, and so if we can eliminate all the gaps and bottlenecks that happen within appointment schedules, then we no longer need the buffer of the waiting room. So, okay, bear with me for a moment, but imagine a game of Tetris. Uh -huh. You've I got a lot. So that's easy. <laughs> oh, perfect. Perfect. <laughs> you've got a series of blocks and shapes and you've got to fit them together nicely. It's very comparable to your schedule for the day. Um, and let's say each shape represents a variable, whether that's a doctor, a patient, an exam room, it's some essential piece to the patient appointment journey. And sometimes in Tetris, the pieces start to, you know, they start falling faster and yeah. it becomes harder to fit the shapes nicely together. And when they don't fit nicely together, what happens? You end up with those gaps throughout the game, right? The same yeah. thing happens with appointment schedules. When the variables don't synchronize perfectly, you ultimately end up um, with gaps. And alas, you need a waiting room to offload these extra pieces that haven't fit into the day yet. Um, and so kind of forward looking is, okay, if we're using that as the comparison of what's happening within schedules and these gaps and bottlenecks are, um, uh, piling into the day, well, we need to figure out a way to sort those out of the day, right? 
Uh, we ultimately need to play a better game of Tetris, if you will. Um, and so part of that is to align all of the, the pieces of the Tetris game so that they fit nicely together um, and take into account all the different variances that are happening between each of those shapes. Um, and really, it's creating a more customized schedule than what has traditionally been done. Yeah. I love the example. And I don't know if you've ever had the experience in Tetris where they, you know, your computer glitches and it slows down or the keys don't process quite properly, uh, then it totally screws up everything. Right. And if you think about that, that's kind of a good analogy for what happens in a practice. The patients don't show up on time. The patients are flipped in a way that you don't expect. right? (laughs) And you're trying to respond to them and they aren't responding. Yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, you change the response time and your Tetris game is totally screwed up, right? Like, and so, I mean, that's a great example of, I think what happens in a practice, right? It just totally screws up the schedule because one patient decides to not show up on time or whatever it might be. Yeah. It could just be one tiny little thing that happens. And now you've been, you know, you end up with five Tetris pieces that piled up on top of each other, which would be essentially, you know, let's say you have a bunch of patients that get backed up um yeah. but it, it does it can take one little tiny thing that just compiles <laughs> no, i love the analogy so is there i mean you know it's interesting you're comparing like a human trying to maximize a schedule versus an ai which obviously you know you all provide a solution for that uh, how much better is ai at at maximizing the the scheduling of it than a human you know like do you have some examples and you know like what types of things can ai catch that a human can't i think it's it's really just using um data and information to provide insights day of for whether that's for the providers for the staff for the patients um sharing some information that will help them run more smoothly that will help a patient know when they should show up Um, and so it's really just being able to make use of the data that's there Um, you know we about reminding them to come to the appointment and that does that impact it as well or it is about understanding like oh this group of patient is is likely to be late or you know, what are some of the insights you've seen as you've kind of culled through the data? Yeah, it kind of goes a little bit deeper than that. Um, those things do definitely, you know, play a, a, a part in the, the process. Mm-hmm. Um, but if we look at, you know, we, we look at all these different types of appointment types, okay. for example, um, versus uh, patient trends versus provider trends. And you have some that, historically want to um that spend more time in the exam room and some that are on a quicker schedule and trying to get in and out of an appointment you know all of these things do impact at the end of the day how the the schedule will flow um so you know the indicators of what happens throughout the day are varying depending on which part of the process we're referring to gotcha and it's amazing to me when I think about this, that we as patients really haven't revolted <laughs> against, I mean, I've waited for hours in an exam room, <laughs> in the exam room, in the waiting room, et cetera. I mean, I have four kids, so, you know, I've been to the doctor a lot and I've spent a lot of hours there. Like, why haven't we revolted against it? And then I also find it fascinating. I don't know what your experience has been, but, you know, I've talked to a lot of people in telemedicine where they haven't been behind like the, they show up nearly on time for telemedicine. I'm like, why is it so different there? And why haven't patients revolted against this? And, and will they revolt and go to telemedicine, right? Like, it's, oh, my telemedicine is going to show up on time. But if I go in person, I'm going to have to wait. Like, that seems like an easy choice, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, great points there. I think you do see a big variance of patients who, um, you know, whether they're arriving early versus late. Mm. And a lot of that is by default, the 
the low confidence in when the actual start time is supposed to be, yeah. um, which I think is a big you know piece of this whole puzzle that we're putting together here is if you want a patient to show up on time, we have to build a confidence that that time means something. Um, so that is a, that is a piece of it, but you, you know, at the end of the day, a, a patient is at their doctor's office because they need care. Right? right. And I mean, patients do complain about wait time all day long. Um, but the tricky part is that the strength of that complaint has only been able to do so much uh, to date. Mm. And most of the provi- most of the time providers, I mean, they, they really don't want their patients to wait. They're not like, sure. you know, I want to fill my waiting room. Um, but unfortunately, our healthcare system is very fragmented, which has created a lot of misalignment among misalignment amongst all of the players that are involved. Um, whether that's, you know, we're talking about execs, uh, payers, providers, staff. Um, But that's why it's so challenging to solve what seems like a very simple problem that is patients waiting. The solution has to be beneficial to all of the players, the providers, the employers, the payers, staff, which means now you're solving a much grander problem than just wait time. And you're looking at the root cause of this problem and how it impacts all of the players and what's the role that they play in fixing this problem. And that's why patients' complaints have only been able to really accomplish, you know, they only go so far, right? And it's because it's a much deeper problem that requires a more integrated and complex solution, um, actually within the system. So that's my takeaway on that. (laughs) Yeah. Your first point is fascinating because we all have that friend, right. That we know shows up 20 minutes late when you're going to lunch. And I have, I have one of those friends and he, you know, he, he shows up 20 minutes late and he's so sorry, I'm late. And I had like, it was gotten so bad that like when he does that, I said, Oh no, I knew it was you. So I planned accordingly, (laughs) but it goes back. Like, what is your expectation of when the doctor's going to show influence? That's fascinating. But then your other point is interesting as far as, okay, the patients complain till they're blue in the face, but the doctors have a different problem they're trying to solve. And to me, that's the, the problem of idle time. Every doctor I know hates cancellations because it means they're idle. And, you know, at least in our current fee-for-service world, uh, you know, if I'm idle, I'm not making money and I've got overhead I've got to pay for, et cetera. So what are the causes that you've seen around this idle time for a doctor and what can be done to really prevent doctors having idle time and, you know, and basically not having a visit where they could be making money and taking care of patients? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, it's a great point. And just to, so we use the term idle time to reference the time which a provider could be with a patient, but some inefficiency has prevented that from happening. Gotcha. Um, and I think it's, it's really important to note that uh, idle time is not necessarily like an error or fault of the provider. If it, honestly, if it were that simple, I don't think we would be having this conversation right now. Um, Is that what you just said? (laughs) No, Um, but exactly. So what might seem like a very simple problem is actually quite complex. And that's because there are so many players, um, or as I like to say, pieces of this Tetris game. Mm -hmm. So if we do go back to the Tetris game from earlier, the pieces start falling faster and now you aren't as efficient at fitting them together nicely. So you've got gaps and on top of that, some of the pieces are stacking up. And so you have little space left to stack on top of them. And just to get back to your question, let's pretend that this Tetris game is a simplified version and there's only two shapes. And those two shapes are, uh, they represent a patient and a provider. And as they start falling faster, those gaps, and those stack ups start to appear and the game gets harder to keep up with. This is the same thing that's happening with an appointment schedule when there's gaps, typically the doctor is waiting. And then when there's a stack up or a bottleneck, bottleneck, typically then the patient is waiting for the doctor. 
-hmm. Now, this is just one example of a vital time or time when the doctor waits for a patient. There are dozens of other reasons why that may happen, um, which could be, you know, the patient didn't arrive on time, the office is down a nurse, there's only one x-ray machine. Um, That list can go on and on. Um, But that's what you really have to, you know, kind of get down to the root cause of, okay, well, if we analyze where these gaps and bottlenecks are happening, that's insightful, but we need to look into it further of like, okay, well, where, why are those happening? What's causing those? Um, And that's where you can, you know, I just mentioned looking at the provider and the patient, if we only had two pieces to fit together, but uh, we actually have many more. So we need to look at the number of rooms that are available, the number of staff that's available the day of the week, the time of day, season, all of these things play into it. And so um, that's why the, what seems like it's so simple to solve is, is quite complex. Yeah. So what is the key to making sure that the physician has a full schedule? You know, is it, is it in the front end scheduling? Is it in the reminders? Is it in the ensuring they're there on time or, you know, I've even seen, you know, full companies that uh, have built products around, you know, oh, someone canceled, how do I fill it, right? And having the wait list. I mean, we, 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 there's all sorts of wait list technology across healthcare as well. You know, what do you see it as the key to making sure the physician's schedule stays full? Uh, you know, I love that question as well, because it, it really um, lets us highlight a little bit about how schedule, scheduling has been done historically. Mm-hmm. So if we look at... Um, you know, traditionally, what does a practice do to schedule appointments? It's very common to see that you've got 15 minute slots for follow-ups and 30 minutes for new patients. And I think one of the really important things to make note of here is that in order for us to kind of slot, let's say slot the whole day out, then we need to be more accurate on these actual durations. Mm -hmm. And, um, And that way you can really flush out the detail. I mean, the day in a little bit more detail and what we call stacking. So you can have the day stacked more accurately. Um, But I think that's, that's kind of one of the main things to look into is, you know, can we get more granular than just 15 and 30 minute slots? And that's where it's like, yes, but it would be very, very difficult for someone to manually do this every day, all day, because now you've just come up with each patient is going to have their own, you know, duration that they'll spend in an appointment. And we can't set a schedule with every single patient having a, a custom um, time for that appointment. And um, so y'all, are, y'all are an hour front office person and can't do that one very well. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm sure Some I'm of sure you can, know. but uh, um, let's say there's more efficient and less time consuming ways to go about it <laughs> um, than, you know, having to manually figure all of that out. So um, I do think that is, is one of the key factors there, being able to keep a, a physician's schedule full and do that in an efficient kind of seamless way. Um, and, and also kind of minimize the bottlenecks that occur in the practice. Yeah, it's a classic part of the way that healthcare is becoming more personalized. I mean, we see this on the care side of things. We see it in the communication side of things. So it's interesting to see you applying it to the kind of scheduling logistics side of things. Do you do that? I mean, so like if you're working with a practice, do they still continue to use their EHR PM practice management scheduler or do they use yours or, you know, how does that work? Do you layer on top of their current scheduler or, or would they use something separate or, you know, how, how do you approach kind of that EHR practice management? Is it integrated? Is it separate? How, how, how do you do that? Great question. Um, 
So we do integrate with their existing scheduling systems. And that's mainly because we don't want any double inputting or double tasks to happen here. The point of this is to streamline and make things more efficient and, you know, reduce task load. Um, and so we do, we integrate directly and we, we pull the schedule information that we need throughout the day. Um, and that stays up to date in real time. Yeah. No, I figured if you'd done it separate, I was like, wow, that, that's a, that has a whole set of other questions. <laughs> <laughs> It makes sense to have Yeah, we, we would have to have a different conversation then. <laughs> <laughs> hey, some people have done that in charge capture, which I think is fascinating, right? But uh, I think schedule would be a hard one to justify. So that, that's cool. So, you know, uh, you know, just to kind of wrap up here, like, you know, I think it's interesting when you, you talk about it in a fee-for-service world, filling that schedule is essential because your revenue is dependent on filling the schedule in, in many ways, right? I mean, you know, you tell me number of visits, you can tell revenue, right? I mean, there's, there's a direct correlation between those two things. But as we shift to value-based care, does that really change that paradigm of no empty spaces in the physician schedule? And, you know, does, you know, maybe the waiting room changes as well, like, uh, because, you know, it's really about ensuring the person stays healthy or, you know, do you think that's going to impact your business or do you think that there's a place for the AI to still optimize even in a value-based care world? I think there is uh, certainly still a place to optimize there um, just for different reasons, right? So under a value-based care model, the intention is to, you know, deliver a high value experience to patients to keep them healthy, as you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, and there's really two things that kind of immediately come to mind when talking about this. And that's one, giving the patient that the time that they need as an individual for an appointment. Um, and then also making sure that the experience is as seamless and kind of uh, frictionless as possible for the patient. So from the time that they actually schedule the appointment to being in the exam with the provider to after the appointment. Um, and I think just these two things alone will have or do have an impact on a provider's schedule throughout the day and, and kind of what a waiting room looks like. Um, part of that is, you know, if we allow a patient to have the time that they need as an individual in the appointment, then you're able to kind of stack your appointments accordingly, right? So if one patient needs 10 versus one needs 20 versus one needs 30, then you can give them the time that they need and, and now have the, let's say those Tetris pieces fit together nicely. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, also making that process seamless for the patient and being able to just show up and go right into the exam with the provider and and that certainly does have a have an impact on the waiting room and its utilization um so yes i think i think the value-based care model um does shift the paradigm a bit but it's it's still optimization and um and delivers value just in a, in a different way yeah you could almost see that there's an argument that under value-based care, you're going to need it even more because you might need to schedule someone for a 42 minute appointment and you may need to schedule this other person for a seven minute appointment, right? Like, mm -hmm. cause, cause of what's needed for that situation to be able to provide them the best care possible. So that's, that's interesting. And then I think there's also an element of trust that, you know, it's, you know, that's what I've often argued uh, is that value-based care requires trust and there's, you know, I mean, waiting two hours in a waiting room is like the opposite of trust, right? You told me to come in at two and you're not seeing me till four. That's, that doesn't create trust with the, with the patient, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that goes back to kind of building that, that confidence behind the patient of like, okay, well, if I tell you a suggested arrival time, um, and then I've, I've set that expectation, you know, kind of up front and I need it, then now we've, you know, we've strengthened that relationship and we've built the trust, uh, just as you've said. 
Awesome. Well, this is a fun discussion, Shelby. You gave some good insights on uh, the future of the waiting room, the future of scheduling. So this is this is a, a really exciting. Thanks for so much for being here. And everyone, be sure to check them out. Uh, Doc Pace, the, the company, to help you with your waiting room challenges uh, and being able to make sure your the schedule's full for your doctor. Thanks, everyone, for watching. If you want to find more great healthcare IT content like this, be sure to check it out at healthcareittoday.com. Thanks, Shelby. Thanks, John.